Let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, and, and this will be on the screen as well for you. Matthew 24, starting in verse 12, and it says these words. And because lawless, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because lawlessness will abound. Has anybody noticed any lawlessness anywhere? Anybody, anybody drive the I-5? I mean, oh man. The lawlessness that you, you are blessed to live, to live here. In this. I, I loved my drive here this morning. Came down and dropped Leanne off in sublimity and then just came on down the back. And it, just, it, was, it was wonderful. We came down 213 and stayed off 205 and I-5. It was just beautiful. But I got to tell you, we live there in Gresham. And, and uh, it wasn't that many, well, was it two years ago that 165 nights in a row of rioting. 165 nights. This city has been devastated. And the devastation that has continued in the lives of people with drugs and all that's happening. And, and, and just down from us, just down the hill from our house. And we, we're living in a lovely, nice neighborhood. But just down the hill from our house, we've now had Albertsons close. And then Walgreens closed this summer. And then three weeks ago, Buy Mart closed. This is within a mile and a half of my house. Why are they closing? Because they can't afford all the theft. They can't keep going. And then Safeway, which is that we, we go to say, Safeway just put, installed gates inside the store so that as you gather your, your groceries and you come, there have to be gates now with someone to push a green button that opens the door and lets you actually leave and then go out the doors. I said to God, Leanne, I said, thank God. Thank God the gates are in, that Safeway put the gates in, because hopefully Safeway doesn't close. This will protect it, and we won't be living in a food desert. I mean, this, this is the world that we're in. This world of lawlessness. He says, the lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow cold. By the way, there's some good news in that verse. Has anybody seen the good news? How about... It says the love of many. It doesn't say the love of. Yes, that's the good news. The love of the many. And that sounds to us like the majority even. That we live in a world where the love of the many. But, but it doesn't say the all. Because God has his people. Amen. God has his people who are living by saying yes to the Lord and the Holy Spirit being, but what is Romans 5, 5? God pours his agape into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. Isn't that a beautiful piece? It says singular. The fruit of the Spirit, singular, is love. And that what love in the Greek is the word agape, self-giving, self-sacrificing love. Oh, man. If the love of the many will grow cold, it says, but that, that the, oh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's agape, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then you put up that little prism. And here comes this rainbow of beauty. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against those things. There's no law written against that. I mean, that's who we get to be in this world. In this world where, where it's so fast going south and everything unraveling and spiraling down. Here we've got God has his people. You and me. To be the people who love like Jesus loves. Says the next verse, the one who endures to the end will be saved. It was striking me the other day. I, I said to Leanne, I said, Guess, you know what, honey? I was just thinking about this word in this verse, and this is what struck me. I thought, I have never had to endure a day at Cannon Beach. I don't care what time of year it is. I, I, I've never had to endure a day there. And I've been there. Pastors, the pastors always have a prayer conference there that first week, like three days after or four, for four days following Thanksgiving weekend. Well, you can have interesting weather there in December. I've walked out there on, on that beach up toward Haystack Rock, you know, with being pelted with hail and wind blowing. I've never had to endure a day. I love it. I love it. It's, but, but what this is telling us is the one who endures the world that is saying no to God. And, and this, let's get to be really clear on this. We've, we've used, we use the language like the Holy Spirit will be withdrawn in the end time. But remember this. It isn't like God says, okay, we're finished. We're, no, no. It's the Holy Spirit that's being beaten away by those who refuse to receive 
this spirit that pours agape into this, on, onto this planet and into this planet, the lives of people. You, you, know, you look at a planet without agape, please vote me off that planet. I mean, it's bloody red in tooth and claw, as Tennyson called it. I mean, it's just, ooh, what a place with no self-giving, no self-sacrificing love. No wonder, he says, the, Jesus said, the one who endures. And by the way, that endurance looks like, in my, my Bible that I've been reading for some years now, and the uh, youth group there at, the youth group at Pleasant Valley Church gave me this as a gift. It's the English Standard Bible. Let's go over to Revelation 14 and verse 12. By the way, and it's, what verse is the verse where Adventists take their identity from? It's right here. This is our identity text, right? Here is the patience of the saints. In the ESV, it says, here is, it's the same word, here is the endurance of the saints. Ah, here's the endurance. The endurance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, get ready for this, in a time of lawlessness. In a time of increase, increasing lawlessness, there are people on the planet that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And the ESV says faith in Jesus. It's an interesting phrase in the Greek. You can say it both ways. It, it actually is meaning both ways. The faith of I, I love the idea of the faith of Jesus because I think of the faith of Jesus, especially this week that our Christian brothers and sisters call Holy Week. This week on, on that Thursday night there in that Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus cried out to his father and said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's the faith of Jesus. The supreme example or picture of the faith of Jesus is when he cringed from that, that going to that cross, and yet he said, not my will, but yours be done. That faith of Jesus, his faith, is the faith that we now have faith in. This faith of Jesus is both his faith and the faith that he now pours into our lives through the Spirit. And so we and I live in that reality. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, law, and the faith of Jesus, gospel. Law and gospel together. Law and God. When I went to Romania on mission trip, it was beautiful. On the front of every Adventist church. Anybody been to Romania? Been to the Adventist churches? On the front of the Adventist churches, they had a Ten Commandments. And then up through the Ten Commandments was a cross. They had the law and the gospel in unity as the picture of the Adventist church in the, in the country. That's how people know the Romanian church. That's, their, that's, their, mo, that's their, land, their logo. That's their brand. The law and the gospel together. By the way, that verse, Revelation 14, 12, the faith of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, we go right back to Matthew 24, 14. If you have your Bibles, we'll go right back there. And it says, and this gospel, so here, remember it said, lawlessness of the many, love grow cold, the gospel, then it says, but the one who endures, and the next phrase is, right in the midst of the mess, the good news of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness to all nations. Then the end will come. This is where you and I are right now. And this is the privilege, the opportunity that we have to live our lives in step with Jesus Christ and to the, praise, to the praise of his glory, that God would be able to use us as channels of love and grace and blessing in this world. So I love this verse because what it tells me is this. It tells me he's coming. So that makes us a people of hope. We're people of hope who are called to be agape lovers. Agape, remember, said God is, that's the Greek word agape, God is self-giving, self sacrifice So we are people of hope who are agape lovers and good newsers. If there's any teachers here, right? Paul, tell me, if I, is that a word? Can I use that? We're good newsers. We're, we have to be good newsers who are agape lovers, who are people of hope. That's who you and I are everywhere we go, in our neighborhoods, in our home, everywhere. By the way, this love thing, let's see. This will be generational. Let's see if we, we get this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing there's just too little of. That's what God has called us to step into that gap. 
in this time of growing lawlessness. That's who we get to be. That's who God calls us to be. It starts in our family. I, I, I had three siblings. I was the oldest. And uh, I, remember, I remember a day where my, my friend Billy came to the house. And he got to come and play after school. And, and his dad came and picked him up after supper. And I remember my mom saying to me after he left, she said, Georgie, she always called me Georgie. She says, Georgie, I sure wish you were as nice to your brother and your sisters as you are to your friends. Anybody know what I mean? Yeah. Love is, we learn to love them, but love is, is at home where we start to look where we love. We start at home and we love, but it's not meant to stay. That love is meant to go out like ripples, to be a blessing to everyone around us. And that love, as it goes out in ripples, means our neighbors and the people down at Safeway that are checking us out. The guy who's pumping my gas and all the, these are all places where we get to be the love of, even when I'm driving on the 205, I get to be one that drives in the spirit of Jesus, not the spirit of Jehu, okay? <laughs> Jehu or Jesus, okay? My wife, yeah, this is why my wife, God is using my wife to bring me to, re, to repentance on this thing, okay? <laughs> I used to always tell my wife, honey, if I wasn't a preacher, I want to drive for NASCAR. So this is a big, so no. Um, so, and we were, we were blessed. We've lived in this neighborhood for 30 years, the same house. And I, uh, we had some friends, we first moved in, who said to us, they said, hey, we've got a puppy we want to bring by. And, and of course, we saw him, but we couldn't say no. But it was a, it was a golden retriever puppy. And but anybody like golden retrievers? It doesn't matter if you like them or not, because they like you, okay? <laughs> they love you. They're goodwill ambassadors. And this, this story might have turned out different if they'd given us a pit bull. I don't mean, maybe. But... Here I am walking, and I walk this little golden retriever, and I start, and by the way, I was also serving as a chaplain at the Adventist Medical Center there in Portland, and, and there I was serving the community, all, all, everybody from the community that comes to the hospital, and the Lord said to me, just the Spirit just impressed me and just said, I want you to be, I want you to be a chaplain to your neighborhood. I want you to love your neighbors. And I thought, well, how am I going to get to know them? Someone gives us a golden retriever. This is how. Everybody I meet, the golden retriever wants to meet. So we go up, and, and we had three. There was Buddy Bear and Ruddy Buddy, and then our third, Sisu Honey Bear. And um, so we go, and, we, and, they, they, they went, and so people go, oh, I love your dog. And, and I say, well, her name is Sisu. Sisu is a Finnish word for resilience, guts. So Sisu, okay, and they go, oh, and I say, her name is Sisu. And I always go, and my name's George. You know, they would say, well, my name's Jim, or my name's Susan. Or, and this is how I got to know everybody in my neighborhood. And I, and I have these like three or four different routes that I walk and I get to know people all over the, this neighborhood. And, um, and then we got a dog, Charlie. And so Charlie was a terrier and um, Sisu's went straight to heaven, I believe, but I don't know about Charlie. Charlie, <laughs> he, these terriers, anybody know terriers? Okay. But they were so sweet. They loved each other. And, and, and this is the sad part of within the last year and a half, they both died. We've lost them. And so I'm out walking without my dogs, and it felt very, very strange. And as I walked, I suddenly, looked, well, anybody know what one of these things is? Uh, not, it's not real, okay. But so I'm walking, and I, and, and I walked by, and I said, oh, somebody forgot to bring there. And I'm walking along, and they forgot to bring it along, and oh, boy. And I walked past, and the spirit just said to me, do uh, you have any grandchildren? And I went, well, yeah, nine. If your grandchildren were here with you, would one of them step in this? I said, well, three or four of them would. <laughs> and uh, so he said, and didn't say a word, just went like this. I went, what? He goes, yeah. huh? And I go, no, that's not my dog. That was not. And so I said, do you have one in your pocket? Well, I, well, I got bags of these left over. Oh, well, oh no. I got bags of these. And I walked over. I said, okay. So I go over. And I go down, and as I'm leaning down, I hear the Spirit say to me, it's your job. And I said, no, 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 this is not my job. No, this is not my job, no. And I get my job, and, and then a week or so later, I'm walking, and I said, oh, someone forgot, and I, and I kind of pay, you know, and, and I hear someone behind me, a, wo a woman from the neighborhood, and, and I know is not, not churched, and not a, made clear not a believer, and I hear her voice. What are you doing? Picking that up. Your dogs are dead. And I said, 
it's my job. And she said, what? I said, well, you know, do unto others. Is it? So I actually had an opportunity to witness right there, right? So, and, and, and about a week or so after that, I'm walking along, and I said, oh, again. So I, I go, and, I'm, and I hear across the street behind me, like a half block away, I hear her voice say to the other woman she's walking with, that's the guy in the neighborhood who picks up all the dog poop. <laughs> Are you allowed to say that in church? I'm not sure. So, and all at once it hit me. God loves my neighbors. That's why he gave me this job, is to get inside her head. Now, I am not telling you this is your job. Do not do this. Do not do this job unless the Holy Spirit tells you. Um, but in doing my job, but, but, but it struck, I, God loves my neighbors. He wants to reach my neighbors. And what am I? He st stuck me here for 30 years. Wow. Um, by the way, just a little parenthesis here. I want you to know every Sabbath morning before I come to church, I scrub my hands so good. I am clean. I mean, you can eat off my hands. Okay. So I want you to know that. So don't be afraid to shake my hand or anything. We're good. Okay. So, um, God's called us to be, as people of hope, to be agape lovers. And as we're agape lovers, we pray the door will open for us to be able to share the good news of Jesus. Amen. I mean, that's what community services is all about. Amen. And it's about, it's, it's what ADRA is all about. Avenant, by the way, what does ADRA stand for? Oh, you're good. A lot of churches say Avenus disaster. And I go, no, no, that's another thing. No, Avenus development and relief agency. And, and I want to share with you just two short videos, two, two and a half minutes. But the first one is about from Cambodia. It's a water project with a lady and her family who have no running water. You'll see the water running in the creek, but no running water and no toilets. And then the second video is a short video. And it's a sad, it's sad to me every time I see it, but it's a family who had to leave their homes in Ukraine when the war started. So let's just watch these very quickly and then we'll come and open the scripture on this. Our living conditions were bad. We didn't have a toilet. We used to push around our home. My name is Tia Kong. I am 55 years old, and I am from Cambodia. Seeing my children face these problems, I felt helpless. So we would drink any water that we could find. We got diseases, vomiting, diarrhea, coughing. We were taking traditional medicines as I didn't have money to go to a health center or hospital. Adra talked with me about raising chickens, growing veggies, having good sanitation, and building a good latrine. This made me feel hopeful. This project has been very important. Uh, it has changed their life. They have uh, received a lot of benefits from the project so far. The children get more healthy as well as hygiene and sanitation and a lot more. Since we received a latrine and a water filter, our family is better. Adra brought change to my family. Our kids could have good health and they are able to go to school. I love my mom very much. She works very hard to care for me. Now I can go to school. They are now getting a good education. It is setting them up for the future. It's a big difference. Life is better than before. I would like to say thank you to Adra and the supporters who have helped my family to change our lives. Thank you. You can give a family the gift of clean water. It makes a world of difference. Donate today at adra.org.au slash donate. Thank you for watching. To view another incredible story, take a look at the video here. And if you haven't already, subscribe and we'll see you in our next video.
We didn't think that we were hungry or we couldn't take shower because there were no hot water. We just were thinking about uh, are we going to stay alive today or are we going to die? And we were only praying all the time and thanks God we are still alive. Slana, I'm staying here in Poland at the church. Well, my family are refugees from Ukraine. My mom, my siblings, sister and brother. Unfortunately, our father, he's a preacher and he's left in Ukraine. When the first day of war started, we hoped it will end soon, but it didn't. And the worst part was that our city, Bryansk, was occupied on the second and third days of war, so just from the start, and we couldn't leave the city at all. And the pharmacies, the food stores were completely empty. People couldn't buy food or even like simple medicines. And also we didn't have any network or we couldn't even call that we are alive. And our grandmother, she was so worried and we couldn't tell her that we are alive. It was so bad. Majority of us don't have relatives or friends here and the only people who help is church. The church gonna give us a chance to have future and help us with the basic things. And here's a bedroom, so we slept here. And it's quite comfortable, it's warm here and nice. And we are really glad that church provided us a place to sleep in. Jesus never asked, who are you? What is your nationality? Are you a good person or a bad person? He was open. And I think this is a good example for us. When we are helping others, it's like Jesus, hence, will be through us. We change because of Jesus, of his impact on us. And we want to be his hands. We want to be his feet. Now the organization has people in and around Ukraine helping the hundreds of thousands of people flee. The groups here at home are getting involved as well. The Maryland aid group is going much farther, 5,000 miles farther, to provide direct help. It's already providing shelter to refugees in youth centers and church buildings. And the volunteers cross the border themselves into Ukraine with this convoy carrying supplies. When they said, like, don't worry, you can feel like at home here and we will help you because we are your brothers and sisters in God. They just supported us and that meant so much. And all God's people said, um, I just want to say thank you to you. I know you are no stranger to Adra in this congregation. You know the Hall family. And uh, you know I've had the privilege to work with Ricky now the last several summers here as we go to different camp meetings. And, and uh, so again, I just want to say on behalf of Adra, thank you. Thank you for the, what you do. And as you leave today, I'll, on the left-hand side as you go, there'll be a table there. Please pick up anything. It'd be nice for me to go home with nothing. Uh, but I've just brought different items that you can pick up and take. And, and again, thank you for the way that you help to bless others um, and touch them, their lives with healing and help. Um, I just, every time I say that last video, I just think about that young woman, Ruslana, and her family and her father who stayed in Ukraine. And, and I just pray for them. I pray, I don't know, we don't know where they are today, um, but just pray that God's hand would be on them and all the other millions who uh, have had to flee their lives torn apart, and you can just go around the world, and you think of Gaza, you think of, of, of uh, uh, Haiti, 
you think just there's so much need, so much need. And then the development work, it's just so significant. So here's my question. And it's the question of the morning. And the question of the morning is this, what we've just seen. Is this the gospel? Or, hold on, hold on. Or is this the fruit of the gospel? So what verse would you go to? Just pick out one verse that you say, here's a verse that describes the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may have heard of John 3.16. Maybe we could go there. Let's say, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The gospel is always about what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. The gospel itself, it's always about what God has done for us in Christ. Amen? That's the gospel. Does anybody know 1 John 3.16? I love this. It really works. Uh, in all the churches, and by the way, today is, you are church number 45 that I've been privileged. Actually, there's some schools in there as well. But only one person has ever known 1 John 3.16. And it was a lady who said, well, I know it's a children's song. And so she knew it. But I love John 3.16. 1 John 3.16 says, by this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. For the brethren, for the others. Uh, next verse. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in that person, in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Amen? Don't just talk in, you know, in words, but, but live it. So I like to go this way. John 3.16, root. 1 John 3.16, fruit. Root and fruit, always distinct. It's important that we stay distinct, but never separate. Always distinct, but never separate. Why is it important that we be distinct? Because we are so needy. This is our default position, so needy for worth that if we help somebody, we might actually think we're doing something that makes us good with God. If I can do enough good things, then God will, God will be on my, he'll, he'll say, okay. See, so we, we, it's so easy. So it's really clear that we know our salvation is always 100% what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. He is our salvation. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen? That's what this weekend, Easter weekend, is all about. That's what it's all about. It's right at the heart of the message of the, of the Bible. Death and resurrection. New life in Christ. So, always distinct, never separate. Now, having said that, uh, let's, go to the, let's just go, go to the verse that we looked at this morning, which is Micah 6, 8, our, our text for the day. With what shall I come before the Lord? Shall I come before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Here comes the big one. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? No matter where you go on this planet, you can go to the Incas, you can go to the Aztecs, you can go over to the Middle East, you can go to Africa, you can come to North America. Wherever you go, you find people looking and going, how do we get right with the great spirit? How do we get, how do we do it? The, the greatest thing we could do would be to give our own child to be sacrificed for the sin of our soul. I mean, I'm reading through Jeremiah recently, and just like, how many times God says in Jeremiah, how could you ever imagine that Solomon's wife, you know, had originally brought, brought one of her, her priests with her, and they built a temple. And, and here's this temple with a God who sits there with his arms up like this, and you lay the newborn and it would roll down into that grate where the fire had been kindled. Just like, oh, it's horrendous. God said, is this what you, is this, is this how I make myself right with God? Oh, look at the next verse. And this is the one we know. And this is the, the, the uh, let's go to our next verse, verse eight. But to do justly, what, what does God require? Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Amen. 
That's what God's re requiring. Quick question. These verses, this verse, which is the motto for Adra, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. This verse, root or fruit? I heard it. It's fruit. It's fruit. This is our response to a good God. You go, well, it is, it, you know, when, I read, I, when it suddenly struck me, I thought, wow, I wonder if there's, in, my, in, in Malachi 6, is the, is the fruit there too? Or is the root there as well as the fruit? Boom, go to 6 verse 4. Look at 6 4. Here's the Lord. By the way, what are the first words of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not? No. First words of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the house of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Therefore, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Fruit. Root is God and what he has done to set us free, to liberate us. Look at these. I, this is in Micah 6, 4. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. He's repeating the first words of the Ten Commandments. God says, I did this. I set you free. I have redeemed you. Now, do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with me. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Root and fruit Distinct, but never separate. This is what God is doing. This is the door he's opening for us. The gospel is about what God has done for us in Christ. And here's the thing. That gift of God, and another word for gift would be the word grace. By the way, how would you define the word grace? Here we go. Grace, let's define grace and mercy. Grace. God giving me what I don't deserve. Does that work for you? God giving me what I don't deserve. How would you define mercy? God protecting me from what I do deserve. Whew. God giving me what I don't deserve. God protecting me from what I do deserve. What a God. No matter they call this stuff good news. This is the God who's for us, not against us. And here's the beauty of it. If our religion, if our religion is rooted in grace, then the rest of our lives are gratitude. And that's not a bad way to live. It's not a bad way to live. The rest of our lives are gratitude for what God has given us and poured into our lives every single day. It's easy for us as religious people to miss this because we're about, we're like, I love in C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He has the church being the beaver dam. We're the beavers. We're the busy beavers doing good things for God. It's easy for us to miss it if we don't have it clear that it's all gift. I, mean, I never forget. And then this was something I, I didn't grow up with, you know, and I, I didn't get it. I went all the way to seminary. I went all the way through seminary and I got good grades. I passed all myself, Pauline epistles, all this stuff. I passed it and I got out of seminary, go to my little church there in Ohio and, and I get there and and, um, well, yeah, I came out of seminary with a, with a master of divinity, which makes me a divine master, right? Yeah. No, 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 do not. No, do not take, no, that's wrong. But here I am. Every, guess what? I came out of seminary. I didn't know the gospel. That doesn't mean there weren't professors teaching it. But no, I was, for me, it was, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And it's like, you know, like, over, it's kind of like, you could even, kind of, our, our country is so polarized, I hate even to say the words right and left, I'll just go, you know, more conservative and maybe more liberal, but over here I go, oh, if I do all these and don't eat this and do this, I mean, if I do these rules, then I get the gold star. I love gold stars. Little boy, my mom would give me gold stars when I do all the stuff on my list for the week, right? I love gold stars. Go to school. Yeah, gold star. Ah, an A. It's, I want an A, not just a B. I want, you know, so all the, you know, go to work. You work 40 hours. You get your check. I mean, it's the way the world works. Do all this stuff. But, you know, religiously speaking, you know, oh, some point, some people say, oh, I can't live in this straitjacket. I'm going to come over. I'll do my little liberal leap. It's not about rules. It's relationship and social justice and all the good. So if I do all these things, then, then I get my gold star. And the Lord looks at both the left and the right. And he goes, Wow. You guys are both in the same boat. You didn't think so. You're both looking down on each other, but you're both in the same boat. You're both offering me the fruit of Cain. Your best efforts. It's not about what you give me. 
It's about what I give you. Here comes your brother Abel with a lamb. I call that the redemptive center. Not the left or the right. The redemptive center where we all are drawn to him from wherever we are. You have in your bulletin, a, uh, you have one of these pictures, I think. This kind of set up like this. And you get a chance to look this up on the screen as well. And so, by the way, thank, where, is, where is Rita? Rita, thank you so much for all your help getting me ready for today. So, here it is. We're going to hustle. Reach, we, yes, we will race through this. Um, but, if you look at this, and if your glasses are good enough to read it, you're going to see... 1876 by James White. This is the book. This is the one with the tree on the front. Okay. 1876 by James White. And, and this was the high tech of their day. And they go, he'd go to a church or go to a, a public hall and he'd lay it all out. And this was high tech. He'd put it up there on a stand, paid big bucks, big bucks to an artist to paint this and gets there. And they would say, so here's the message. By the way, they, they, this is a picture of revelation 14, 12. Here are the commandments. Here are they, here's the patience of the saints. This is what it meant. Here is the patience of the saints. We're not going to set any more dates. We will be patient. As Adventists, no more date setting. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And then up in the corner is heaven, paradise. So they said, this is the way it is. If you'll do everything the Father said to do in the Old Testament... And you'll do everything the son said to do in the new. You get to go to heaven. How you doing? See? So here it is. By the way, how many laws, how many laws did the rabbis discover in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch? Yes, I heard 613. Yes. All right, my man. Yes. 613 laws in the first five books. And then you just add, oh, there's probably a few more laws in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But guess what? I had two brothers come to me once at Pleasant Valley Church and said, I am so glad we live in New Testament times. The Old Testament was so hard, so many rules. The New Testament, ah, just two rules. Love God, love your neighbor. I said, oh, have you read uh, Skip McClarty's book, professor from Andrews University, who's added him up. There are more rules in the New Testament than there are in the Old. Huh? Yeah. What? Yeah, you have the gospel proclaimed, and then it always says, and there, because of this, now, love one another as I've loved you, forgive one another as I've forgiven you. I mean, there's a lot of commands in the New Testament, more than the Old. Wow. So, you go, okay, so what are you going to do with this? Here's the, here's the thing, and this is the amazing part, and this, by the way, this is in... Woodrow Whitten's book called Ellen White on Salvation. Also, Professor Andrews just retired. And in the book, he has a piece of a chapter where he says, on his deathbed, on his deathbed, James said to Ellen, Ellen, we have made mistakes. You know what I say? Thank God. Thank God he saw that. And Ellen, this is in Woodrow Whitten's book, quotes her saying, I took a vow at my husband's deathbed that I would bring in a new element into our church, into our movement. Turn your page over. Guess what the new element looks like? This is 1883. By the way, there are only two religions in the world. I know there's a lot of names. There are two religions in the world. There's do and there's done. That's it. <laughs> Do and done. People look at this and they say to me, Pastor George, the Ten Commandments just disappeared. What are you doing here? I go, what did she do here? And I go, look, uh, what, do, does anybody see lightning bolt over there in a mountain? Which mountain do you think that might be? It's Mount Sinai. Ten Commandments haven't disappeared. Even more significant, the man on the tree is the one who said, I always do my father's will. And at the, la the table, the last supper, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the many, for the remission of sins, forgiveness of sins. And what are the words of the new covenant? Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10. I will write my law on your mind that you will know my will and on your heart, the organ of desire 
that you would want, actually want to do what you ought to do. I am never more free. This is a personal testimony. I am never more free than when I want to do what God wants me to do. When I, I'm the freest man on the planet. That's in the, in the New Testament. That's the normal Christian life. That we receive the Holy Spirit and we get to live in this, this reality. This, this, this good news gets to be lived out in us. And by the way, when I say it's due and it's done, the done piece goes on. Jesus says, it's done. 100% your righteousness. What is Hebrews 10, 14? For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. Check me out on this one. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified, those who are in the process of being made holy. As Sister White said, the work of a lifetime. It's a process of a lifetime, but it's in the context of having made being perfect. Jesus, robe of righteousness, I get to live in that reality. This is good stuff. This is amazing. 1 Peter 2.24 uh, that's the verse I put with this one. 1 Peter 2, 24. I'm going to get the pound on the pulpit. He himself. Oh, this is good. He himself. Big emphasis. He himself bore our sins, yours and mine, in his body on the tree. In order that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Have you noticed what I'm doing here? That we may not die to sin and live. What am I doing? Baptism. To unite with Christ, Romans 6, don't you know, we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death, and then raised up to walk in newness of life. This, by the way, the newness of life is life in the spirit. It's the spirit who makes us alive. Life in the spirit is the normal Christian life in the New Testament. This is who we're called to be. You talk about being free and set free. Wow, it's amazing. And we get to, to live this reality like in our neighborhood. I mean, I've lived there 30 years, and I walk around, I get to know all these people, and the Lord laid on my heart and said, hey, you're a chaplain of the hospital, I want you to be a chaplain to your neighborhood, and, and, and get to, so I, I, I ask people, they tell me, oh, my husband is, he's sick, he had to go to the hospital, I said, oh, I'm so sorry, can I pray with you right here? Uh, yeah, it's just, the very good water. and I pray with my neighbor, it's just like, we get to do this, these are the people we get to be around, we're set free people. We just get to be Jesus people. The, the, I mean, I'm 72. How many years do I have left? How many days? None of us knows, right? We get to do that right now. It isn't like we wait for some big thing in the future. I want to end this. Okay, we're going to go one more thing and do. See this piece? This is also in your bulletin, and you have two pieces. I, Ellen White, she's the champion of the gospel. You take Ellen White out of the Adventist church, and I know we go, oh, Ellen, yeah, I know. I know how she was used. I know... People go, oh, no, she made everything, all the rules. Guess what? You take her out of the church, and this church does not know the gospel of Jesus Christ. This piece of paper is the clearest statement of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ the way of life, ever written by an Adventist pen. Clearest. And by the way, the title, Christ the way of life, I have written that on there. I put that on there because I'm convinced that it is the verbalization of this picture. Christ, the way of life. This verbalizes what this picture is saying. Let's read it quickly. The condition of eternal life is now just what it's always been. What it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Perfect obedience to the law of God. Perfect righteousness. I've written a big 100% over in my corner over here. What? When I used to be a teacher, I'd say to the kids, so what score do you need on your test paper? Are there young people here anywhere? Yes, young these ladies over here. What score do you need on your test paper to get into heaven? Anybody know? And I always have kids say, well, here at school, it's like 92 for, a, but 93 is a B minus and, and, uh, and, or an A minus, and then the B minus starts, at, B starts at B plus. And then someone, was, someone would always say, uh, does God grade on the curve? Okay. Can God just do, I go, it's 100%. When you get there, what, what are you going to do? Uh, Wow, how are you going to get that 100%? Let's keep reading. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. Think about this. Cain. Oh, if only Cain had not copped an attitude. The Lord comes and says, uh, where's your brother Abel? 
If Cain doesn't cop an attitude and go, am I my brother's keeper? If Cain drops to his knees and goes, oh, in a fit of anger, I murdered my brother. You know, God, please forgive me. Would the Lord forgive him? I know. Doesn't seem fair, does it? Would the Lord forgive him? He would forgive him. So, so having asked this, let me ask, this is, this is a question, just to see if we're tracking. How many say God forgives sins? Amen. Amen. How many say God does not forgive sins? Okay, there's one hand in the room. Get ready, fasten your seatbelts. God does not forgive sins. He does not forgive sins. He forgives sinners. He forgives. Cain, would you please forgive me? I forgive you. What does God do with sin? He makes atonement. He says, when Cain says, please forgive me, the Lord says, okay, I forgive you, Cain. But there's this other little item. Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground for justice. I am in the person of my son. I in the person of my son. These two are one. I in the person of my son. I'm going to take it in the neck for that cry of justice. I'm going to bear it on the, on the cross. By the way, if you ever hear a, a three-party atonement, the three-party atonement, this is a false picture. Whenever you hear, like, well, Cain murdered his brother. God has wrath against that. And Cain, but Cain says, please forgive me. And so God goes, oh, what do I do? I know, I know I'll beat up my son. That's a false picture. No, no, no. Cain, please forgive me. And the father says, I forgive you, Cain. And I, in the person of my son, because father, son, and spirit are one, we're going to go through this thing, and we're going to bear this, and we're going to pay the price for this thing. Now, think about it. Because people tell you, Pastor, you better, look at the way. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sin. Forgive us our sins. And cleanses from, he forgives us. Okay, let's keep going. We got to finish this up fast. Um, it was possible. Look at this possible. It was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law, but he failed to do this because of his sin. Our natures are fallen. We cannot make ourselves righteous. We can't do it. Since we are sinful, unholy, we cannot perfectly obey God's holy law. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. Here we go. But Christ, but Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. He now offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. Oh, this is the glorious, amazing exchange. If you give yourself to him, accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been for his sake, you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character. You are accepted before God, just as if you had never sinned. Whew. And all God's people said, and all God's people shouted, hallelujah. Okay. This is amazing. hundred percent. What in the world? What a gift. Now, Sister White, the first two paragraphs, justificate. I love the justificate. Just as if I had never sinned. Just, it works in English. Just as if I had never sinned. Justification. Now she shifts to the sanctification piece. Sanctification is where we're being made like Jesus. More than this, Christ changes your heart. Here comes the fruit. Here's the root, first two. Here comes the fruit. He abides in your heart by faith. You're to maintain this connection with Christ by faith, the continual surrender of your will to him. So long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So you may say, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Jesus said to his disciples, it's not you that speak. The Spirit of your Father, he's actually going to give us words to say to our neighbors, to our loved ones. Then with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness, obedience. And I'm going to add the word love, loving like Jesus loves. Last paragraph sums it up. So we have nothing, nada, zero, zero, nothing in ourselves of which to boast. We have no ground for self-exaltation. Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ. 
I love that picture, the robe of Christ. She, what did she say? Not a single thread of human devising. It's all God. His, by the way, I tell people now, what two books am I reading? Great Controversy, by the way. I think Sabbath School starts it next week, doesn't it? The, new, the study of Great Controversy. The Great Controversy for the time in which we live. But you're not going to have any joy unless you have, know this one, Christ our righteousness. A.G. Daniels, everywhere I go, I went to, went to Grant's Pass, they ordered a hundred of these books. Right now, people are struggling to find copies because there's almost no copies around. I have talked to all these pastors. Do you have this book? They go, yeah, I have the book. Have you ever read it? No. I said, me either. I had it on my shelf for 30 years. I never read the book. And back in December, I, I pulled it out. I, thought, ah, I started to read it. I'm now on my third time through. I'm just reading my third time through it. This is amazing. 1924, 100 years ago, 100 years ago. What did he say 100 years ago? How sad, how deeply regrettable this message of Christ, righteousness in Christ at the time of his coming met with the opposition. The message has never been received. Huh, do you hear that? A hundred years ago, the message has never been received, nor proclaimed, nor given free course as it should have been to convey to the church the measureless blessings wrapped up within it. So I go, if it wasn't by the 20s, from 1888 to the 20s, was it the 30s? 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. In 73, a man named, anybody ever heard this name? Maury Venden came to our school, Columbia Union Colleges in Washington, D.C. I just given my life to Christ in the summer of 72. I come back to school and he comes to our week of prayer, spring of 73. He goes, Christ, our righteousness. It's like, but then it got lost. It's like it got forgotten again. It's like, how did this happen? I know how. Because our default position is this one. And not just for Adventists. This is the default position for Anglicans and Adventists and Baptists and Buddhists and Catholics and Communists. This is the whole world. This is the way the world works. If I do this, you owe me that. The world doesn't operate on grace. This is the one that's counterintuitive to the way the world works. And that's why we keep forgetting but we're at a time right now, folks. Our world is ready to go into a crisis. I don't know how you stop this runaway train from not hitting World War III. I'm not making predictions about when. All I'm saying is, we're in a moment in time. We're in a moment in time where God needs his people to be able to be the people of joy, the people who have hope, people of hope, who are good newsers, who are agape lovers and get to share this and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, no matter what the news brings tomorrow. What a privilege we have to be these people at this time in the world's history.